Outlet Liquor is your place to buy a case. Stock up and save when you shop the lowest prices available every day at Outlet Liquor. You never have to wait for a sale. The more you buy, the more you save. Only at Outlet Liquor. What's your outlet? Math is a wonderful thing. Math is a really cool thing. So get off your ass, let's do some math. Math, 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 math. Yeah. Bill's Mafia. Don Brown. Yeah. It's the mafia, you know I'm rocking with the bills. It's the mafia, you know I'm rocking with the bills. It's the mafia, I'm with the Buffalo Bills. It's the mafia, you know I'm rocking with the bills. Hey, hey. Who you reppin', what's your team? Who you reppin', what's your team? You know I'm reppin' for my team. I got that talent on my team. Micah Hyde, Jordan Boyer, can you catch it? Can you? Trade day is like a mask, do not catch it. Folks, math is a wonderful thing. Welcome to a new episode of the Crowd Assist Podcast presented by Trainwreck Sports. As always, Wake here with Kevin Misery. Sorry, you know what? I've I've messed up your name so many times now. Let's settle it once and for all. How should I properly introduce no, my yeah. actual co-host? No, you hit it. It's Misery, so you hit it good. Misery, thank goodness. <laughs> how's your How's your uh, Monday going, man? It's, it's it's finally the draft's over, and I was exhausted personally. It's finally <laughs> another Monday in paradise. Really looking forward to jumping into this and getting through some of these these RAS scores, and couldn't be more excited to to break it down and uh, get a little bit of knowledge into this this so called math. Yeah, yeah, it's exciting to break it down. And we're it's exciting and we're lucky to have this outlet for all of our Bills takes. And everyone, thank you for being here. You guys can have an outlet too. And of course, I'm talking about our good friends at Outlet Liquor. No matter your taste, wine, or spirits, they are here to make sure your cabin is stocked and loaded. Located at 2152 George Urban Boulevard in Depew, open seven days a week for walk-ins and curbside pickup. Outlet Liquor, the place to buy a case. What's your outlet? Joining us today, Kent Platt. Uh, he's on Twitter at MathBomb. He's the creator of the RAS score, which I guess might be the wrong way to say it since the last word in that is actually score. <laughs> so so I don't mess that up any more than I already have. Kent, thanks for being here. You're here to explain this so Kevin and I don't have to, and I appreciate that. <laughs> hey, thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, it, the whole RAS score and RAS score and stuff kind of kind of throws people. I should have thought about that when I made the abbreviation, huh? <laughs> I mean, I just I just want to make sure I'm doing your work justice. I mean, it's 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 an interesting thing because you, it's it's been flowing around Twitter a lot lately, uh, especially over the past like couple years or so. Maybe mainly this last draft cycle is when I think I really started to see it take off. So just just to, as a as a intro for dummies about it, what is the relative athletic score? What does it measure, and uh, what made you think of coming up with this exactly? Yeah, relative athletic score is a, a, a zero to 10 score that, that just measures a player's athleticism uh, relative to their position. So it's all the, all three letters mean something. R is for relative. It's, it's relative to a player's position uh, and it compares it to uh, 1987 all the way to their, the current draft year. So it's 35 years of data for the current draft class. Mm -hmm. um, the idea is to take all the individual measurements and put them on a zero to 10 so that people can understand real simple. Zero is bad. 10 is good. It's pretty straightforward, right? Uh, it takes all of those individual measurements and it puts those together into a composite score, which does the exact same thing. It's another zero to 10. So you can look at a player and be like, you know, based on a score of zero to 10, how athletic was this guy? Um, I started it back in 2013. Uh, we had a lot of, you always hear those buzzwords, right? A guy's explosive. He's quick but not fast um you know all, all those things don't have any meaning they don't they don't mean anything <laughs> without any context so raz was an attempt to provide some context behind it um because we had guys like Le'Veon bell who ran a four six who people were saying oh he's unathletic he's he's not very athletic and it was absolute bull crap um he was he's a, a 230 pound back who ran a 685 in his cone that's ridiculous for a small running back but for a bigger <laughs> running back, that's insane. You kind of that, that kind of athleticism. But he ran a four six, so he's unathletic. And I didn't like those type <laughs> of superlatives you can they get thrown around because there's no context behind it. And it's it's one thing to say, well, he's not very fast. That would be accurate. But saying he's unathletic was just totally false. So I, I tried to dispel that a little bit and I created it 
Um, it expanded again in 2017 when I got a, a boatload of data. Um, and it's expanded every year by thousands and thousands of players every year since then. Uh, right now, the database has around 21,000 players currently from, again, from 1987 all the way to 2021. Yeah. And, and the one thing that, that still got to me there is relative by position. So the way that you look at offensive linemen is going to be extraordinarily difficult from the way you look at a quarterback or a running back. Yeah, I mean, if you had a if you had a, a offensive lineman that ran up four or five, that would be incredible. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but you're you're not going to see that generally. Um, one of the examples I always give is like a, using a four or five, for example. That means something completely different for a cornerback than it does for a defensive end. A cornerback runs a four or five. That's like yeah, I mean that's okay. That's that's decent. That's that's not slow. It's not super fast, but it's not slow. But a defensive end runs a four or five. That's blazing. That's that's yeah. really fast for a defensive end. And mm -hmm. there's a huge gap between those types of things. Uh, same thing for offensive linemen. You run a five flat for an offensive lineman. That's really good. That's 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 a great benchmark to hit. But if you run that as a wide receiver or a corner or a running back, that's not so good. You're not going to get a whole lot of good good usage with a skill player who runs that. Yeah, no, that, that completely makes sense. And and I was toying around with the site a little bit. And obviously, you know, we'll get into the Bills draft class a little bit here because obviously you want to get your take on on some of those guys that they took. Um, I was fooling around with it because Spencer Brown, who they took in the third round, was one of two players in this NFL draft to have a perfect 10 out of 10 on the RAS. And I like to call it the RAS now because that's just better than RAS. So that's fantastic. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the thank you for the nickname. That might be the best piece of intel I've gotten so far. <laughs> <laughs> um, but obviously, you know, and then I, I've moved him into quarterback. And obviously then when I changed the position, his value went from a 10 out of 10 to an eight, six or something around that level. Uh, and so when someone has a perfect 10 out of 10, like how much of an anomaly is that? Because the other one for the, for the record, for everyone watching was another offensive tackle, Creed Humphrey, who was taken at the end of the second round. Uh, so how rare is it for that 10 out of 10 to happen? Yeah, we only get maybe one a year. We got two this year. We we actually have two offensive tackles that would have had it because Sam Cosme who went to the Washington Redskins, I believe, mm -hmm. or Washington football team. Right? <laughs> um, you know, he he would have held that if Spencer Brown hadn't attested just bonkers insano, you know. But uh, it's it's not very common. The, the last offensive tackle to do that was Taylor Lewan. That was way back in, what was it, twenty. 12? I don't know how long Taylor Lewan is. Something like that. Yeah, I remember sitting in my old, like, my, one of my old classrooms in high school, making up mock drafts with my teacher and writing yeah. Taylor Luan on the board. So, yeah, he's, <laughs> he's been around for a little bit. And he was the last offensive tackle to, to hold that position. So, it doesn't happen very often. We switch him around. Calvin Johnson is still holding on to wide receiver one and probably will forever. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some, some people are just absolute freakazoid mutants at their position. And it's just hard to see anybody ever coming anywhere close. Yeah, and, and I think that like the last question that I have on this right now before we go into specifically the the Bills group, uh, the, the group of players that they drafted, is that like obviously you know one, no one metric is perfect for analyzing and evaluating players. So exactly like you know for all the people that maybe say like you know stats are for losers, this only measures one thing, it doesn't account for this. What is Raz's place in player evaluation for college exactly? Like to dumb it down for the people who are the most skeptical. Yeah, and this is where people always get me because they think they think I'm going to like jump into the, the defense of the metric and be like, no, 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 it, there's all these numbers behind it and all that stuff. <laughs> and I, I will explain the numbers, but you should never look at any individual metric and be like, no, nope, this is the only thing that I need. Nothing else provides any value. Uh, the intention behind RAS is meant to be a, a contextualization of athletic testing. It's not meant to be the only thing that you look at when you're evaluating a player. Now, I don't run an NFL franchise. I'm not a general manager. So for me, I get to make bold statements like I would never draft a tight end in the first three <laughs> rounds if they were below five for RAS. I get to say that because I don't run a team. I, I don't have to worry about missing out on some great talent who just happened to, to test poorly. But I also know that not a single tight end in the last 35 years has recorded a 750 or greater yardage season um, with, with a RAS below five, um, who wasn't injured at the time. Jordan Reed is the only one that's ever had a RAS below five that hit that mark, but he was hurt when he tested. He only, he only just barely qualified. Um, so I, I can do that because from the ma a mathematical standpoint, it makes sense. 
but GMs have to weigh the tape. They have to weigh their own personal evaluations. They use their own timing even. Um, I know a couple of years ago, the Packers drafted Jay Sternberger, who was only like a five something for Raz, but he tested way better at his individual workout for the Packers than he did at the NFL combine. So there's a lot of other factors that go into it. Another one is injury. A guy gets injured. Darius Leonard hurt himself running his 40 yard dash. He's got a below average score. I don't like drafting linebackers with below average scores, but if you have a guy who's obviously athletic on tape and then he tests poorly, but he got hurt while testing, you know, that's a bit different than if he tests poorly, fully healthy and had no concerns about it. Then you got to go back to the tape and be like, you know, is, am I missing something or is the tape, or is uh, the testing not showing the talents that he's winning with? Is there a hard rule? Like, I mean, obviously there wouldn't be as you're just going over, but is there a hard rule of a number? You're just like, I don't care if it's a fifth round, fourth round, I'm not touching someone with a Raz of three or two. Um, you know, like Voshan Joseph was a bill that, you know, scored mm-hmm. under a one um, drafted <laughs> in the fifth round and no yeah. longer a part of the, you know, one of the few players that, you know, haven't still doesn't have a roster spot on underneath uh, Brandon Bean. Is there a, a, a number you're just like, I don't care, I'm not touching it, or, or do you not look at it? like So as a math guy, like you just said, you don't run a team. Uh, yeah. But is there a number you're just like, I don't think there's much success here. If it happens, maybe it was one of the variables you just mentioned. But other than that, is there just like, I all things considered, we don't think an injury, you know, I really don't want to stay, I really want to stay away from under four or under three. Yeah, and it's a composite metric, right? So it's, there's 10 different combine metrics that this, this measures, and it's it, it creates an average that's used in the final score. The final score is not an average, uh, but it's based on an average. And if you're down in that two and a half and below range, most of your metrics are, are bad, right? Most of your metrics are bad enough that your average is really, really poor, um, which is where you've really started to get into the category of where do they win? Where does a player actually win? And it's very rare that you get a player that hits. Uh, Most recently, we had Orlando Brown hit, uh, formerly of the Ravens, now with the Chiefs. Uh, Orlando Brown had a famously horrible combine, one of the worst combines in the history of the NFL. Um, But Orlando Brown also didn't win by being a quick lineman. He didn't win by being explosive off the line. He won because he had a massive wingspan and incredibly long arms. And he was so smart about how he used angles and how he uh, attacked rushers and how much space he gave himself for a counter. And we know all that because we go back to the tape and also because he told us, uh, because he, <laughs> he had an interview about that very specific thing. Um, so it's it's helpful to look back on that stuff. But I, I always love to use Anquan Bolden as an example because Anquan Bolden wasn't fast and he wasn't particularly explosive, what we think of explosive from an athletic standpoint. But when the ball was in the air, that was his football. You had to win against him physically to get that ball out of the air with him. And you generally weren't going to win that. You were going to lose that battle more times than you won it. Um, so sometimes it's just that it's not, it's not something that's tested, which is why it's such a weird thing to look at for quarterbacks because quarterbacks, quarterbacks that don't run, does their athletic testing matter at all? And if so, to what extent? We don't really have a clear answer on that because most of what makes a quarterback work aren't tested in those drills. Yeah. And, and and maybe on the converse to that, you know, talking about guys who are super low, you know, obviously anecdotal data or just, you know, individual, you know, outliers are going to be the first case that people come to for like the, the attack of a score like this. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the bills and I was doing some digging, looking at the past draft classes under McDermott and Bean, um, Zay Jones, former receiver out of the second round in, the, in McDermott's first draft is actually one of the highest RAF scores, Raz, sco- not Raz scores, Raz's. <laughs> uh, if that you roll it in a one, it works. If you, if you roll it one to say Raz scores, it works because you're using that S as the part of it. Ah, it's a part. Oh, thank you. It's thank cheating. You. <laughs> it is. Yeah, it's it's the R A is abbreviated, but the score yeah. is not. That's fantastic. I like that. <laughs> but you know, for is there is there like a almost um, there's no. It's probably a stupid question. Is there such a thing as too high of a score for a certain position potentially? No, but you're you're looking only at athletic talent. So there's there's other pieces that go into it. You know, Zay Jones had had some troubles with drops coming out of college. There were some other exactly. issues that that became you know became more concerning. It, it, there's never a case where a guy is too athletic, but there is a case where those other risks 
maybe make it too too much of a risk to actually take take a chance on a player. You know, if you have a wide receiver who just can't catch anything, do you think you can coach that? Is that something become that, a corner? <laughs> right. Throw them in the corner. And teams do that. Teams have done that in the past. You know, you, you got to start looking at where that return on investment is. And it it, it varies based on position. You know, at tight end, you, you see a lot of guys drafted who are super athletic at tight end, maybe don't have the experience, maybe don't have the production. But because tight end is one of those positions that projects so well with athleticism, teams are more willing to take risks on that. Oh, yeah. Whereas with wide receiver, where there's so many different types of wide receivers and so many different ways to win on a football field, some of which aren't necessarily shown in testing, it's a lot easier to take a risk on a lower score guy because they might not win in a way that matters for the testing. Um, Another example is nose tackles. Nose tackles don't test that well because nose tackles only care about being big and strong. And that's only two metrics right there out of 10. So they generally don't score well because they usually have high weight, high bench, and they should have a high broad if you can get one. But even then, that's only three out of 10 metrics. The other seven metrics are usually garbage. All the time drills are bad for nose tackles. Yeah. But, you know, it doesn't matter because they don't, they don't need to be bursting through the line of your play. They just got to cover a lot of space and hold people there. Do GMs ever give you a call? Do they ever say, hey, what's going on? And, or even lower level scouts? Like, do you ever hear from someone like, tell me about somebody or what, what's going on with their RAS? Like any, any, any of that, like at any level? Yeah, and I can't I can't go into too many sure. details with it because of, of who it is. But yeah, I get the the biggest one I get is agents. Players themselves often want to know what their scores are, where they're where they're going to be at. That's a lot of where I get my numbers from are agents, scouts, and players. Um, you know, it's people just want to know what their stuff is. They're very competitive guys. We had a player in this draft class who had like a nine eight nine, some obscenely high score. Wow, uh, but it, right. But, but he was mad. He was mad because when I adjusted for the official numbers, it went down by 0.01. And he was mad about that. He was like, no, <laughs> no, no, I don't want that. He's like, I want that, I want that highest score. These guys are great. competitive. Um, scouts, scouts do contact me quite often to figure out where a guy is, where a guy scores. Um, I added a calculator to the site, so I didn't get that a whole lot this year. Um, that might that might long-term be shooting myself in the foot because I rely a lot on that networking. Um, but it's, it's, it's helpful to be able to see where a guy ranks and where you can look at a guy compared to their peer group. And you said last, last thing before we get into the, to the bills draftees, it's fun. I keep saying that, but I feel like there's so much to unpack here. There's so much to cover. (laughs) You, you, you get numbers from the players or their agents themselves. So does, and you, you said you adjust it based off of that, because obviously getting the numbers straight from them, there'll be some kind of bias just impacted into that right so you'd be surprised um generally agents don't give you juice numbers um you, really you think they would and and i've talked about uh, vested interest before anybody that's followed my page knows i talk about vested interest quite a bit uh because there's there's people who have a vested interest in a player doing well will tend to give you the best numbers that they hear players will usually ask for whatever the best numbers they get the first time and i'll provide it for them because it's not it's not anything i'm posting out on twitter or anything i'm just, providing it as on request, but they'll usually give you what they've heard, which is, well, they, I also heard this. I also heard this. Where does that put me? Cause they want to know what NFL teams are looking at. They don't just care that they got a high score. They don't care. Mm-hmm. They want to know what NFL teams are saying. And NFL teams get numbers from one of two sources. They're either getting it from their own scouts or they're getting it from the APT, which is a group that sends out those numbers to teams that weren't present at any particular pro day. Um, whenever you hear official numbers, that's what we're really talking about is, is either the numbers from the APT or the numbers that the teams have from their own scouts. Um, anything else that's, that says official is just, it's just not really official. Um, <laughs> schools, in the past, schools would give out whatever best number that they heard was as well. We didn't have that as much this year. This year, schools were pretty good about providing whatever the numbers that were sent out was, which would impress me. I didn't expect that at all. I expected it to be like last year, which was just pandemonium. Um, (laughs) But the schools in general were much better this year at providing accurate numbers. And I'm hopeful that that's a sign for how things go forward from here is is that schools will be more accurate. That way we don't have to adjust a whole lot. I don't have to keep answering, well, wait a minute, I thought he had a four, five, one. (laughs) And it's like, no, no, that's not how it all works. Uh, the easiest way to tell is if it has splits. Uh, if you have a number that has the 10, the 10 and 20 splits, it's a way better chance that those numbers are accurate 
um, because they're not coming from just one stopwatch. They're coming from somebody who has multiple stopwatches, which is usually a team scout or yes. somebody who has access to the team. Gotcha. And now we'll get into the Bills guys here. And I did just take this from a screenshot. So the, the graphic will not be the best uh, quality. I'll make sure the interns do better next time, I promise. <laughs> uh, but we obviously, you know, the, the Bills draft class was highlighted by going edge rusher twice. And Carlos Basham probably, you know, between him and Rousseau, I'm not sure who puzzled Bills fans more with the pick of it. Um, so, you know, it doesn't have to be about those two. Obviously, Spencer Brown and Tommy Doyle are were one and two. Uh, or I think we're both number one when they got picked in terms of the RAS scores available. Um, so when you're looking at the Bills draft class, and I know, you know, you, I'm going through your website, you do a lot of work looking at all the different teams and everything. You can click on, you know, filtering it all out. So, you know, what sh did anything shock you with where some of these guys were taken? Were there any really good athletic values? Um, obviously, probably Spencer Brown highlighting that. Yeah, and I expected Brown to go a little bit earlier because offensive tackles that score that high on that level tend to go really early. Um, there's only one example that actually was drafted by my Lions back in like 2008 or 2007, one of the guys that had a 10 previously. Um, I don't even remember his name, so that'll tell you how how that that turned out right yeah um but again you're looking at athletic talent alone you're not looking at that in any other context than how athletic the guy is but offensive tackles teams tend to reach for those they tend to go out and, and grab guys a little bit earlier so even though spencer brown's coming from a smaller school he still managed to last, last to the third round um with that kind of testing um you know other guys like boogie basham i, I love basham as a player from an athletic standpoint, guys that are that big don't usually test that well. Right. Uh, and he mm -hmm. tested really, really well. We actually have a subgroup that I'm in the process of building back out on the site. It's not currently up yet um, to, to use for three, four defensive linemen, DL, you know, uh, defensive linemen that are over 265-ish or whatever, but under, I think it's 310 was my, my threshold for it. Uh, because that's a, it's just a different type of player. You're not looking at a defensive tackle and you're not really looking at a defensive end from a traditional standpoint you're looking for somewhere in between there for players that play on the edge in three-man fronts uh, over the three over the uh, or over the five but never the nine and never the one you know um, that's the type of guys you're looking for it's not quite yet built out on the site but I built it specifically for guys like Gregory Rousseau and Boogie Basham um, but Basham didn't even need it he scored a 9.38 anyway just compared to regular defensive ends because he tested that well um, so that stood out very positively to me. You don't usually have guys that big who test that well. Now, do you think the instant production will be there? Um, so the Bills went back to back, obviously, it was much talked about here in, in Western New York. Do you think that with those type of, even with Rousseau, you know, almost Soren and Aid himself, do you see the production to be there? Do you think that there's going to be no raw talent or do you think that athleticism score, obviously the Bills will like everything else they saw on tape. There's a lot to like for both of those players, um, tape, tape aside. Do you think the athleticism will translate day one that, you know, the Bills, if they're missing something um, from their AFC championship team, it would be probably getting to Patrick Mahomes. Do you think that both of those guys athletically will be able to participate in, in, in being more productive than, you know, say your Mario Addison's um, or your older defensive ends that the Bills have here? Yeah, it's always tough when you double down because you're you're going very young at the position. You're getting rid of a lot of experience, and you're, you're hoping that the younger guys who come in bring enough that they can make up for that lack of experience. From an athletic standpoint, there's not really too much to be concerned there, but you're also looking at a different type of pass rusher. You're not looking at your guy that's going to be out on the nine, just balls to the wall every single play. So do I think that these guys are going to come out and be double-digit sack guys year one? I don't. And they might they might never be just because of the type of players that they are. Um, it doesn't mean that they won't be. It, it doesn't mean that you should just discount that either. It's just a different type of approach for a different type of player. Um, you know, Michael Bennett was, was a good example of a defensive end who was productive for years and years and years. But he didn't get double-digit sacks every year because that's just not the type of player that he was. Um, you have guys that, that thrive in the NFL in those type of roles. Um, so long answer is I, I think that they're, they should provide an immediate benefit to the team. Uh, I don't think you're going to see all that statistical production up front just because they went so young, so quick, and in that way with those types of players. I don't think you're going to see that production immediately. Hope you do. Yeah. 
<laughs> oh, I hope we do too. And that's why we were asking you, because it seems like, you know, obviously you built this, uh, this, you know, this algorithm yourself or with the help of some people. I don't want to leave anyone out by it by mistake. Um, but, you know, it, it seems like you do a good job of balancing the, you know, there is an eye test, you know, an actual, you know, whatever you want to call it, you know, there is someone who has the eye test, they might not, you know, succeed in the NFL or whatever. Um, but it seems like you do a good job of meshing what you can see with what you can't necessarily see all the time. And how important is that for something like this, especially for people like, as we see this year, Spencer Brown, and Tommy Doyle, who really by all accounts have long tracks ahead of them to make an NFL roster. Yeah, it's, it's incredibly important if you're, if you're using it to evaluate players, you know, evaluation of players is not an exact science. It's not something you can look at and be like, I I've watched a couple of games. I am now a full fledged NFL scout. I know everything that I'm doing. There's so much nuance to every position and you should always try to learn more. If that's something that it interests you, if that's something that, that it entertains you and keeps you occupied, it's, it's a great thing to do. A lot of people are getting into it. That's why, Grass has been picking up the way that it is because it's simple and easy to understand. And the market's there. There's so many people that want this type of information. Uh, but you always have to look at the nuance behind it. And, and I mentioned that why you never look at the, the scores by themselves and that's it. You're done. Uh, because sometimes you have guys that have great scores, but you watch them on tape and you're like, where was that? Like, where, where was that during the games? Because I didn't see that. It was, it was all over the place. And you try to figure out why. You ask yourself why. Um, it's, it's what you should always do whenever you have a guy that tests the combine. If you have a fast guy that runs fast, great. Check, move on. <laughs> Nothing else you have to do. You know, there's, yeah. there's no reason to go back to tape because you thought he was going to be fast. If a guy runs fast on tape and then he tests slow, you ask yourself why. You find out if he was hurt or if there was some other uh, mitigating factor when he tested. Then you go, go back to the tape and you'd be like, is, is he just running against slow players? Because that happens every now and again. Um, they just go against guys that are slow, so they look fast. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's that they're explosive but not fast. The Lions drafted Amir Abdullah in Nebraska some years ago, who was a great yeah. athlete, but he uh -huh, was not fast. <laughs> um, it, it's just that he was so explosive and so quick that he gave up. He gave himself a big cushion uh, that people had to chase down. Um, so you're you're trying to find those things. Maybe he isn't fast, traditionally fast, but there's another element to it. Um, I like to point out safeties and defensive backs because there's there's a subtype that I'm trying to do more research on for safeties and defensive backs who don't run very good 40s, but they're explosive and they still find success in the NFL. And you can you can find those guys because they'll have good they'll have good verts and good broads, and then a good 10 split, but a bad 40. They'll run like a 462, but they'll have a really good 10 split and really good explosive drills. And then they find success in the NFL anyway. They tend to fall in the draft because they didn't run a great 40. And people get scared off by that stuff. Uh, but speed isn't just run straight, run fast. Speed is getting from point A to point B. And sometimes that means reacting quickly and being able to get in motion and up to full speed faster than somebody else could. And yeah. that's way, where you start to mesh that tape with the, the, the measurements themselves. Because sometimes that will line up. Sometimes it won't. Um, and, and you got to try to learn that that's learned. It takes time. It takes energy. Yeah. It takes effort. So, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, Kevin and I were sharing, exchanging texts, uh, and, you know, tweets of yours, uh, before when we, when we found out we were going to have you on. And I wanted to bring one up that, that he sent to me that, that I definitely wanted to, you know, get you to explain a little bit. Um, you know, bills have had a hard, have been a hard team to pin down in terms of athletic approach, alternating between different levels of risk taking, but they've shown shrewdness in how they address those risks with the players they've taken for the roles they need. So, so in terms of the bills and a team that, you know, it's been difficult to pin down if they value this or how they value this. Um, what have you seen from them? They're 2020, by the way. Whoa. Yeah, look at the 2020 there. That's not – again, we'll get the interns to make some, to get some better screenshots for next time, but that's a lot of red there. And what about Tyler Bass? Why don't you do it for kickers? <laughs> I do. They just don't test most of the time. Um, I, have, I have like 100 kickers over 35 years of data. Um, I, I do track it. Same thing with long snappers. I track it. They just don't usually test. 
and I'm, I'm sure there's no value to it. It's, it's more, a, it's more a peculiarity than anything. <laughs> well, Epinesa, uh, Epinesa seems like a totally different type of defensive end than they took this year. He is, and I love AJ Epinesa. My, my current role with, with Pro Football Network, Network actually started with AJ Epinesa. I, I got brought on to Pro Football Network to write um, because they wanted me to do uh, some articles on athletic testing and things like that. And the first article I wrote was about AJ Epinesa because. Everybody was was making this big hullabaloo about how he tested and how he was gonna gonna plummet in the draft. He was never gonna make it in the NFL now because he tested poorly. He was like, how how did he test differently than what you expected him to test? Because he isn't a fast defensive end. He isn't a quick defensive end. He's huge and has really long arms, yep. and he uses that length really well. But nothing that he did during during his testing looked different than what you saw on tape. It just doesn't give him a nice, good composite score, and it's a poor 40-yard dash. So, oh, God, he's terrible. We can't do anything with him. But that's not it at all. Um, when I built the data set out last year for the defensive line, that's part of why I did it. It's players like him because they, they aren't accurately represented with the drills that we, we present at traditional position groups, at defensive end versus defensive tackle. Uh, because if you run him as a defensive tackle, his score is significantly different. You're not looking at a guy who has a four uh, athletic score. You're looking at a guy that has a seven, eight, six athletic score at defensive tackle. And it was over eight when I did that defensive lineman subset. Uh, because those guys have success in the NFL all the time. They're just not represented the way that they should be uh, among traditional testing. Um, so that's him. I'm, I'm, I had to go into my rant for Epinesa. I love this player. Um, other times, it's just it's just things that are valued differently. You know, you want to you want to get a power back. They're going to have a, a poor forty in general. Power backs just don't don't do that well for the forty yard dash. So if they don't, that's that's three scores 40, 20, 10 that are poor. That tends to drag down the overall numbers. But it doesn't mean that power backs are bad. It doesn't mean that they are garbage players. It just means that they're they're a different type of player and they have a different role. Um, one of the things that I think Bean does well is he's very good at evaluating role players, guys that play roles. And there's a bit of a stigma around the term role player. Uh, there shouldn't be. I, I, people want everybody to be a superstar, but there, there really shouldn't be. Sometimes you don't need a guy to be a superman in his position. You just need him to do his job and do it well. And you draft a guy that does a job and does it well and you're fine and nothing else matters and when you start doing those types of things you start finding guys who don't test quite as well overall because they don't need to they're only doing one or two things and if, if they're if they're testing how they need to for those positions it's totally fine it don't matter yeah and, and you bring up you've been bringing up a lot of name brand running running backs really Le'Veon bell i know you just mentioned another one there and i did put out a thing on twitter earlier about uh the lowest ranked bill that's been drafted since mcdermott came in uh that's still on the team and technically voshan joseph still isn't listed on the bill's depth chart right now so the person who fits that bill of being the worst is actually devin singletary with a 1.73 Raz. Uh, you can see Jake Fromm, an unathletic quarterback, coming in at two. The Bills' number two running back, potentially, and Zach Moss coming in at 2.88. Now um, you know why I wanted a running back, by the way. Now <laughs> we know why Kevin under two, to under draft. three, yeah. and Zach Moss is probably looks even worse than the one, one, uh, one seven three that Singletary has to me. Um, but I mean, <laughs> there's just no athleticism there. And, and yeah, a running back, that's a position where you need it, isn't it? <laughs> it, it is. I, I did a long thread um, right after their first round of the draft concluded. I did several long threads about the types of players that have succeeded in the past. And I went over running backs covering pro bowlers, thousand yard rushers, and those sorts of things. You can go look that up. Uh, but you don't get guys that test poorly very often. They do happen. Um, they, they don't. They, you're, you're still not. Again, you're not. You're not saying everybody who tests poorly is just never going to be good. Mark Ingram is still the only running back drafted in the first round that had a Raz below five. Uh, but Mark Ingram was also a good running back. Zach Moss had injury issues and some other things that were a bit concerning, uh, but he's a 223-pound back. He's not a small back. So the fact that he didn't test out great isn't that big of a red flag, um, as long as he's able to still back it up with his play. You know, he's, he was a guy that had a ton of missed tackles and, and things like that in college that, that had people excited about him. But he doesn't have any breakaway speed. He's not super explosive, you know, and, and that's fine if you can find a role where that fits, which is where I think Devin Singletary has been able to do. He's been able to carve himself out a little bit of a role 
um, and, and be that receiving scat back type of guy um, and be at least reasonably productive in that role. Again, not a superstar that's going to gonna blow everybody out and go to 47 Pro Bowls, but you know, he's doing his job and that's perfectly fine. We had a guy in this draft class, Demetri Felton out of UCLA, who had that same type of role, who hated his Raz, by the way. <laughs> um, but, but you know, it's, it's, it's math. It's not me. It's just math. I don't, I don't, I don't assign these grades. They're assigned by math. Um, but, you know, it, it, it doesn't mean that he's never going to have a role. I think that this, there's a similar type of situation there where he's going to come into a role where he's going to have a carved out niche where he's going to fit in that offense. And as long as he's able to do that, he can be very productive in that. Yeah, I mean, it's not a 9.2 of Travis Etienne. Um, and do you buy, just your personal opinion, would you buy the Bills being interested in a running back at, they picked 30, obviously with Gregory Rousseau. Najee Harris, not quite as high at, at a, as a Raz at, at a five, in the fives. Do you buy the Bills would have been interested had, let's say Rousseau went instead of uh, Etienne to the Jags. Would you, would you believe the Bills could have been in the market to add that kind of explosive athletic talent? I think they would have been. Um, it, it comes down to that role thing again about how how being this kind of attacked roles, and that, that's why I mentioned he's a, he's a bit tough to pin down how they've been attacking yeah. their positions. Um, but even where ETN went, you know, they mentioned that that they've got roles for James Robinson, they've got roles for everybody in their backfield, and they thought that ETN would make a great like third down back to start out career. And it's like you don't usually draft third round backs in the first round. Okay, we'll <laughs> we'll hold off on that one. Um, but if you're if you're trying to build an identity for your for your offense and you have certain types of players already installed in your offense, picking a guy like that in the first round isn't as damning as it would be for a team like my Detroit Lions, who have nobody at any position, who are in a full on <laughs> rebuild. You know, teams like that should never draft early running backs. The Lions will do it again next year. They they draft an early back every other year. It's it's clockwork. Oh yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But you know you shouldn't you shouldn't if you're you don't already have a team. Bills already have a team. You guys already have a stronger roster with a quarterback in place. You guys don't have to sit here and pick and choose and, and be labor over that stuff. You're filling out specific roles for an already strong roster. So I think the Bills absolutely should have been in on a running back. I think they might have still been in on a running back. I think Javante Williams was still an option for the team. They for just sure. decided to go in a different direction. Yeah, and I mean, can't we can't let you go without talking about Josh Allen's 9-7. Um, <laughs> I mean, talk about a perfect example of it working, like your score showing that, you know, this means a lot to the position. He adds a lot of dynamic abilities, even if he's inaccurate, well, he can kind of figure out the inaccuracy while he relies back on his athleticism, his arm talent, um, just being a winner. You know, he, people love him. I mean, anyone will take a bullet for him, um, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, is this an example or what of, you know, pointing to this Raz and saying, you know, he had some higher hopes and some scouts thought, um, and, you know, now, you know, depending on where you place them, you know, you could place them anywhere from third to seventh best quarterback in the league. So, you know, would you would you say that that was a fair and accurate representation? He scored a nine, six, seven. Um, he had a better shot than many thought he might have. And it goes in, it goes into how the NFL has been changing over the last few years. You can't just be this guy that sits in the pocket and is a, a total statue. There has to be some dynamic element to a passing game. And an athletic score for a quarterback, again, I mentioned that earlier in the broadcast, you know, it, it's not always going to show you everything you need from a quarterback. And it didn't in Allen's case. He was inaccurate as all hell in quarterback. Um, you know, he needed a lot of work in the passing game. But as a runner, never a problem. You're talking about a, a big quarterback that could run. He was quick. He was fast. He was strong as a runner. He was explosive when he was able to push into guys and able to break through the line. When, when he decided he was running, you had to try to take him down, and then you had to catch him. And then you had to actually pull him down. Tackle 252. It wasn't, <laughs> yeah, it, it wasn't as easy, you know, but it, I think it did a good job of displaying the type of player that he was from an athletic standpoint alone. Um, and, and the Bills were able to capitalize on that by bringing him in and having the patience to develop him into all those other areas and help him find a way to learn the areas that he needed to without having to just rely being that overly athletic guy. I think we're going to see that more and more. The 49ers drafting Trey Lance is a perfect example of that. Yep. You know, team, teams are going to go after guys like that because they know now, having seen it, that, that if you have invest the time, you can develop those type of players into something dynamic enough to win football games without having to just carry the game if they can. They can actually go out and win stuff for you. And I think that Allen's going to be one of those turning points where teams are starting to really shift that way. 
investing yeah. time and talent and energy into a player goes through a long way. And then obviously him and Tremaine Edmonds just had their fifth year option picked up yep. both Raz greats. Um, so they, he, you know, from the bills perspective, just looking at it on paper beside last year, it does seem like they utilize the Raz score to an extent. Um, you know, even looking at why Teller guy who ended up working out the bills traded for a uh, two third rod day, three picks, turned it into what Stefan Diggs, the, you know, the bills will tell you that worked out for him, but you know, that would have been great to have a guard like that, but it does oh, seem yeah. like they utilize your ability and your score. Taron Johnson's another, I made huge play, um, in the playoffs, um, bringing back on, on Lamar Jackson to the house, 101 yards. So, I mean, it does seem like you have a lot of, a lot of ability to the bills using the Raz score 2020 aside. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. teams, NFL teams use something. They all have their own metrics. You're talking about scouts that have been in the business for 30 years who have installed systems. Um, I back to I, I, though I did talk to a scout from the Philadelphia Eagles some years ago. It's not with the not with the program anymore. He's been he's been off off the, but while he was there, they had installed a system that that did something similar to what I did. It, it builds out an athletic score that gives them an overall grade. The Patriots have this extremely complex system that gives all mm-hmm. kinds of numbers and grades and colors and things. Um, everybody does it differently. But Raz does such a good job of tuning my own horn. Raz does such a good job <laughs> of, of, of contextualizing it in a simple visual way that it becomes clear to fans what teams are prioritizing athleticism which teams are not as much, or at least have their own method of looking at those types of things. Uh, Because it's such a simple and easy to understand system, uh, teams like the Green Bay Packers, the Indianapolis Colts, Philadelphia Eagles, who have for a long time drafted premier athletes, you know, that stuff really starts to show up once you can see it and actually see something that shows, yeah, eight, nine, eight, you know, 7.5. All these guys lined up with really high scores. Once you have something that you can point to and say, yeah, look, that's a very clear trend. You know, whereas previously we don't really have that. That, that, that didn't really exist in this meeting. And, and this will be an opportunity for you to endear yourselves to Bill's fans very, very quickly. Um, you mentioned quarterbacks before and how they need that athleticism. You know, obviously Zach Wilson has a little bit of that, not a lot, but he's able to improvise. Mac Jones, however, is exactly that statue of a quarterback that you say that maybe NFL teams should try to avoid. So was Mac Jones going to the Patriots middle of the first round? How did you feel about that as him, or maybe not even him going there, but him as a prospect, you know, transitioning to the NFL? So Mac Jones scored better than I expected him to. He had like a 7-1 or something like that. You're not endearing yourself. You're, I said endearing. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm getting there. Okay. I'm getting there. Um, he scored better than I expected him to because he doesn't have those traits on tape. He doesn't show the ability to run, the ability to move, even the ability to just move around the pocket. You know, a guy like Drew Brees, Drew Brees wasn't an elite tester. He was better than I think than a lot of people would have expected. Uh, but he wasn't an elite tester. But he could move around the pocket so well that it didn't matter that he wasn't going to break off and run every five minutes because he could maneuver around the pocket really well. We didn't get to see that a lot from Mac Jones. I, I, I He showed at his, at his testing that he might have that natural ability to do so, um, just like Josh Allen, something maybe he could grow into. But on tape, it's not there, and the ability to run is not there. The, the ability to be dynamic in space is not there. None of those traits show up on tape with Mac Jones. Um, so I, I don't think that picking him in the first round, I, I'm, I wouldn't have taken him in the first round now. Um, I, I grade quarterbacks very differently, and, and you're either a first round quarterback or you're not. And for me, yeah. he is in the second category. <laughs> Well, people are going to be extremely happy to hear that. You know, we're on topic of other teams. So I know, you know, you know, you don't just look at the Bills, you obviously look at the entire NFL as a whole. So, you know, from a RAS perspective, from just a general roster construction perspective, who are you a fan of what they did over draft weekend? There's so many teams that did that did a really good job over the weekend of trying to bring in athletic talent and trying to fix different pieces of their roster. Um, I did a, a couple of threads earlier today about teams that actually hit all time marks for the types of athletes that they were bringing in. Uh, the Dolphins, the Panthers, uh, the Washington football team. They pulled in a ton of elite athletes trying to fill positions that they needed um, to develop into. So it's, it's not just filling positions of need, it's filling positions of need with high ceiling prospects and finding different ways to build out of it. Um, I, I didn't expect this, but my Detroit Lions even had a really good weekend when it came to that. They pulled in players that they needed. Um, they all had high athletic talent up until the seventh round. And those are just 
dibs on on drafted guys anyway. Um, but you're you know I think that they did a really good job as well. Um, the Raiders didn't shy away from elite talent. They just picked guys too early for where they should have. So they probably would have been on the other end of that spectrum. Um, mm-hmm. But a lot of teams looked for high athletic talent this year. The average uh, RAS for the draft class was 747, I think, 7.47 out of 10. Um, so that was to say, overall, athletically, teams were looking for athletes in this draft class. And so, you know, moving forward here, I know that on the website, it said there are a lot of updates for this too soon, a lot of updates to Raz. And I'm sure some of the things are going to be beyond our pay grade and what we can understand statistically. Um, but, you know, and maybe you don't want to fully divulge, but what are some of the cool things that people can expect to come from Raz in the future? Yeah, I've, I've, I launched the the player compare cards. You've shown a couple of voter team compare cards. I showed you those yeah. here. Um, that, I, I did that like last week. <laughs> uh, I, 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 got those in, I got those in right before the draft. I know that fans wanted oh, wow. those. We had them a couple of years ago um, before I had moved everything online. Everything migrated online in the last year. It, it used to all be a local download that you'd have to go get. Everything's online now. So I'm trying to fill back in some of the stuff that we did have in the local one. Uh, being able to do side-by-side compares is something that's going to be coming back fairly soon. Um, the the actual card itself that pulls up the players is already done, so that, that part's done. The, the part that isn't working is being able to say, pick this player and then pick this player and then compare them. Uh, so I'm still trying to put that together. But you'll be able to pull up two players side-by-side and see all of their metrics and compare them side-by-side. Um, I've already started building out some of the individual write-ups. Uh, we have an explosiveness write-up, which was used by uh, CFL scouts. CFL scouts have very specific explosive metrics that they look for in testing. So I built that out on the site so they can they can select a player and do an explosion write-up, and it'll give them whatever the breakdown that they need for it is. Um, I'm doing a similar thing for speed, where it's going to show like miles per hour. Um, with the rise of the whole GPS stuff, you're going to hear miles per hour a lot more often because that's what GPS is measuring is miles per hour. Um, from a testing standpoint, it's just neat. It's, it's less useful than it is just it's just neat. Fans like seeing miles per hour on stuff and seeing how fast guys ran. Um, but from my standpoint, it's, it's just math. If, if you can figure out how fast a guy is going over a set period of, of space, you can figure out what the miles per hour is, right? Um, so I'm going to build that back out, and then uh, I'm going to be building out uh, future draft classes ahead of time. I've never done that. I have never done that before. So we'll have the 2022, 2023, 2024 uh, draft classes on the site, um, and I'm doing that because I'm linking to scouting reports, uh, injury reports, arrest reports, any other scouting information I find that might be useful or interesting. I'm going to be linking onto the site. So when you pull up a player's card there'll be an option to pull up the links and see, okay, here's all the scouting reports that I'm able to find. That way it's just like a one-stop shop. You know, you could, you could go Google that, but you might have reports 10 and 12 pages deep. Uh, yeah. I'm hoping to make that a little bit more accessible for people who are trying to do that game tape as well, whenever we can. Uh, it's a little hard because some of that stuff gets pulled down and all that stuff, but i uh, hoping to get that back up. And gosh, there's so many things I've been working on so many different things with the site. Um, I think those are all the ones I can, talk about there's other stuff i had nbas for actually i can't go into (laughs) (laughs) well i mean it's been a pleasure to have you here and and as someone said in the chat earlier you have a mustache and it's the only (laughs) one that that can rival that uh the one guy that we have ib does work on degenerate dangers in our gambling podcast main host of our of our sabers show um so it's definitely refreshing to see some some elite facial hair coming in here, especially because one of the sponsors of the show is Manscaped. And you can use promo code trainer for 20% off and free shipping. So that is a great segue to get a little plug in for them. <laughs> Kent, it's been a pleasure to have you. Just remind everyone where they can find your work and where they can find all the fancy things that you were just talking about. Yeah, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at MathBomb. Um, it's, it's pretty easy to find me. I'm always on Twitter and I'm always ready to talk some football. Uh, you can also find me, I changed the, the website. It used to just be relativeathleticscores.com, but that's long and people forget it. So it's just <laughs> ras.football now. So you can go to ras.football uh, and you can look up any of these cards, the team cards, anything you want to look up. If you want to see how they did in 1997, you can go look that up. Um, you want to see whether Spencer Brown would make a better tight end than an offensive tackle. You can go look that up. You can go look up a lot of, a lot of different things on the site. The intention is to make it as, as user friendly as possible. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm doing all the coding myself. So if something's broken, just again, at Matt Bob on Twitter, <laughs> let me know. 
Um, and you can <laughs> oh, also yeah. find me at a, a Pro Football Network. I'm the applications developer there. Um, I didn't build it, but I maintain the mock draft simulator that they use, oh, nice. um, which is I'll wow. be fixing some things right after this call. Um, so you can find <laughs> me in any of any of those places, and I'm, I'm always available to talk football. So hit me up. Yeah, I have a little experience with coding and, and stuff and building out websites on WordPress, and I can understand. And I do say I do appreciate the work that you do because <laughs> it is it's a lot of work. There's a lot of there. stuff that goes into it. People don't understand it. So so thank you for for you know compiling all that everything you've done so far. I look forward to using the RAS score uh, in our draft coverage for next year. It's weird to think that the draft coverage is finally over, but. It is, uh, but I know that we'll get you back on soon, maybe maybe in the draft cycle next year to preview uh, some of the fun guys coming out. So, again, thank you, and we'll talk to you soon, all right? Thanks, guys. Have a good one.